Hi everyone, first of all, I'd like to start this video with a quick word on what happened in Moscow a couple of days ago. I struggled a lot in my head because, well, I was thinking that if I say something, I will appear as opportunistic and if I don't, I might be insensitive, which is even worse. So quickly, I was living in Paris during the Bataclan attacks nine years ago. It was actually a 10 minute walk from my apartment. Actually, my girlfriend even heard the shot. And these are wounds that take time to heal. And my heart goes with the people of Moscow and of Russia. And yeah, I hope you will recover. So back to the topic of today's video, I'm going to react to a history legend about a possible French involvement in the Ukraine war. And it's important to establish a couple of facts because, well, there's a lot of emotion and things seem to be out of end. Uh, since Macron made his statement. So first, what did he actually say? In his statements, he says that he does not rule out the deployment of troops in Ukraine. He said nothing must be excluded to pursue our objective. Russia cannot and must not win this war. After that, what was the French opinion, French reaction on his stance? 68% of French people disapproved his statement, 76% disapprove of sending troops and 50% still approve of material support for Ukraine. It's still a majority, but it's minus 8 points since last year. Important to say is that France is a parliamentary republic with indeed a strong executive power. Nevertheless, we are a constitutional state with checks and counterbalances to the power. Deciding to send in troops, let alone go to war, involves a number of stages. First, the president is actually the head of the armed forces, but he must first coordinate with the European Union and NATO. And in all cases, it is subject to a vote by parliament, which probably would not pass. One last stuff. Macron's rhetoric is martial and he sometimes seems to dream of being kind of a war leader. During his speech announcing containment at the start of the pandemic four years ago, he repeatedly hammered out, we are at war with Churchillian accents, the Walmart Churchill, if you want. So, with all this established, let's dive in history legends video. My friends, is it me or we are inching towards World War III? As you might have heard, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, is considering the direct intervention of French military personnel in Ukraine. Madness, madness and stupidity. Modern diplomacy wrote, Macron, an advance of the front towards Odessa or Kiev could trigger an intervention by France. The problem with the French is that they can be quite impulsive in regards to warfare. Because I always agree to attack. Oh! On French... Um, impulsive. I think that you need to develop on what impulsive means because you just show a video from John of Arc implying the Hundred Years War where Actually, our knights were <laughs> impulsive, but actually it's like, what, six centuries ago? And in this war, actually, we were the defenders. So what is our impulsiveness? TV, they are already discussing about the ludicrous idea of sending entire regiments up to the Dnieper to scare the Russian army. What you have... Okay, fact checking on that. So I found the video, it's a 20 minutes long video and they 
are talking about two scenarios in the eventuality of an intervention. First, send an intervention force in the Dnieper River in order to dissuade the Russians to go further into Ukraine. The second one in, is to send forces to relieve the Ukrainian force alongside the Belarusian frontier, which is non-belligerent. But they are insisting on the fact that this is in the eventuality of a dramatic development in Ukraine or to respond to the possibility that the international aid to Ukraine is delayed. It is just the role here of a strategist that has to cope to any kind of eventuality. I have to know, is that since May 2022, as part of NATO's mission Aigle or Eagle, France is leading a task force of 1,000 soldiers deployed in Romania. What is their true purpose and what can they do from there? Rumors claim that off-camera, Macron also said, Anyway, in the coming year, I will have to send some dudes to Odessa. The Ukrainians are already heavily fortifying the region, but with diminishing supplies of ammunition and a shortage of manpower, it might not be enough if Russia decides to launch a full-on offensive across the Dnieper. That's why we could witness Operation OCD, Operation Croissant on the Dnieper, to secure Odessa and maybe her son. The objective would be to prevent Ukraine from becoming a landlocked nation. Let's go, in and out, 20 minutes adventure. The French could also launch Operation BBC, the Belarus border coordination to relieve Ukrainian units guarding the sector. There is also a third option involving Moldova, but I'll keep the surprise for later in the video. On the 20th of January, French national TV reported that the 12th Regiment of Curiosiers is currently carrying large-scale exercises near the Ukrainian border with its 13 Leclerc tanks. And Lieutenant Clemence essentially said their 10 million euro tanks currently have no real countermeasures against drones. At Lichny, excellent, I will soon have the entire NATO collection pack. Leopard 2, Challenger 2, Abrams, only Leclerc is missing. Realistically, is France even ready for war? That's what newspaper Le Monde was wondering. Meanwhile, Colonel Goya says France is like a crocodile. Big mouth, small arms. What are Michel Goya is a very interesting person. He's a former marine colonel who today is a historian, consultant and a writer. In the political sense, as I understand, he's more of a free electron, not totally in favor of Emmanuel Macron, of course. And what I know from him, actually, he wrote a couple of books, an excellent one. He works closely with another historian and military expert, Jean Lopez, who is the French referent on Barbarossa and the Eastern Front during World War II. I don't think anyone has studied the Red Army like he has. I don't know his political stance or his feelings about Russia and Putin or their true projection of force capabilities. They can't just wing it like they do in Africa against rebels fighting with AKs and sandals aboard Toyota pickup trucks. To be honest, France didn't even start fighting that they're already facing ammunition shortages. On the 20th of January, Le Figaro wrote, In France, we have the capacity to produce 20,155 millimeter shells per year. For your information, that's just enough to help Ukraine for three to four days of battle. And so that, that's a concern and politicians as, um, as acknowledged that this was a problem and France is uh, conducting a rearmament program. Actually, the military budgets are planned to be doubled by 2030 check out what that same Colonel Goya said recently in an interview. Si on n'a pas les moyens d'envoyer des obus russes, ça veut dire qu'on les a pas non plus pour nous pour mener des éventuellement des opérations de grande ampleur. Meanwhile, some French analysts think that this warmonger rhetoric to be just a political stratagem right on time for the next European election set for the summer. What's funny is that some of the most vocal supporters of the war in France don't actually want to fight the war themselves. They claim to be more lethal behind their laptops than with a machine gun. Of course they are. Of course.
The worst in all that is that the French army already launched a similar expedition on Odessa. In December 1918, French troops disembarked in Odessa to save the white armies from collapse from the advancing Bolsheviks. The operation ended in a complete failure. More on that at the end of the video. Welcome to History Legends, here are the latest news of the Russo-Ukrainian war. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. As you know, some of my Ukraine videos have been targeted with limited or no ads. So make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Thank you everyone that has already helped and welcome to the headquarters. The dilemma is that the French president declared that the war in Ukraine is existential for France. Une guerre qui est existentielle pour notre Europe et pour la France. This means not only for France or for Europe, fact the Russian Federation attacked a sovereign state in 2022. This is an action that cannot go unchallenged by the internal community and which is seriously destabilizing the European and international balance. Europe cannot let Ukraine down and neither can the US, by the way that Ukraine's struggle to survive as a nation is also by default France's struggle to survive as a nation against Russia. Right. Yeah, it's the fact that if you let a sovereign state uh, annex another sovereign state, then this means that the first one can do the same stuff with whomever he wants. So it's not existential for France, it's existential for everybody. Now the question of the French government is how they can best support Ukraine. Number one, indirect approach, more weapons, more ammunition, more advisors, and especially more money. Number two, direct military intervention, aka boots on the ground. France also feels bad for having abandoned Poland in 1939. You see, this is pure rhetoric effect. It's like when I'm arguing with my girlfriend. You didn't do the dishes last night? Oh yes, but you forgot to do the shopping two months ago. See, both are factually true, but they have no bearing on each other. And it's just a way to mess with your mind. You could also say that France feels bad for having eliminated Ukraine in the playoffs for the 2014 World Cup in Brazil, and that's why we are helping them so bad. So to make history right and not to repeat the same mistakes, after two years of indirect military support, with the Ukrainian army struggling on the battlefield, Macron decided that sending troops to Ukraine could be envisioned in the near future. And he publicly announced it without even warning his NATO partners. In panic mode, many NATO leaders publicly denounced the idea of sending European or alliance troops to Ukraine. However, since then, as you can see on the map, some countries are now favorable to Macron's strategic vision. And but these countries are Poland and the Baltic states, those who feel directly threatened by the Kremlin's expansionist policy. So here we can say that Macron has been preaching to the converted. And of a direct military intervention. Before covering Operation Croissant on the Dnieper, let's talk about France's current support to Ukraine. France has already supplied the Ukrainian armed forces with a lot of military equipment. This war effort includes thousands to 84 anti-tank rockets, three Milan anti-tank missile systems, six TRF 155mm towed guns, 30 Caesar 155mm self-propelled howitzers, four M270 LRU rocket launcher vehicles, two Crotal NG air defense missile systems, six Mistral man pads, one Sam PT air defense missile system, 38 AMX 10RC light tanks, and 250 VAB 4x4 armored personnel carriers. As you can see, this is quite significant. Uh, on a déjà donné 40% of notre artillery. Qu'est-ce qu'on va donner en 2024, à part vider ce qu'il y a dans nos casernes, mmh. dans nos régiments, pour les donner aux Ukrainiens Ce qui veut dire que s'il y avait un engagement de force, sous une forme ou sous une autre, mmh. avec quoi partiraient nos soldats Et Bien sûr. Voilà, c'est tout. Did you see that 40% of all the French army's artillery Now as for ammunition between 2022 and 2023, France delivered 30,000 artillery shells to Ukraine. In January, a report for the French Senate revealed the country only produced 3,155 millimeter artillery shells per month. 
of which roughly half is sent to support Ukraine's war effort. We are winning! With that being said, that the big... And it's true that the report is kind of alarming, but it's due to very low government orders. Actually, it's the private sector that will supply these shells, so it's always a question of supply and demand. If there were an intervention, which is pretty unlikely once again, or hypothetic to say the very least, I can only imagine that the resources would come from the international aid, just as with the Ukrainian army, because deliveries from other countries would not stop then. But once again, if they was an intervention, Beginning of the war in Ukraine, the French production was only 1,000 shells per month. But in the grand scheme of things, Russia is producing about 250,000 artillery munitions per month. This means the Russian industry overtakes the French monthly artillery production in roughly 30 minutes. French TV also admitted that there are French military advisors working with the Ukrainian army staff to plan operations plus the additional presence of French special forces on the ground. But, as you can expect, very little is known about that. We also know that NATO and France are somewhat involved in military operations in the Black Sea, officially only for intelligence gathering. For example, on the 21st of February 2024, a French E-3F long-range radar detection aircraft operated in the Black Sea. And same thing happened on the 12th of March. Following the leaked conversation of German generals, we learned that British and French personnel are operating cruise missiles donated to Ukraine. Whoa, big surprise! Who would have thought about that? On top of that, there are roughly 300 French military instructors in Poland. It was reported that they can supervise and train roughly 600 Ukrainian recruits per month. To be honest, sometimes I even wonder what they're teaching them. In this documentary by the French National TV, we see this unit clearly struggling to deploy, storm and clear a very basic trench network with no enemies inside or return fire. Their instructor admitted that the soldiers are too grouped up, they don't know how to maneuver and how they would all be KA or injured in a real battle. A direct military intervention looks very promising. Now the Russians also... Okay, fact checking once again. There it is, I found the video and... I think some of it was lost in translation and maybe I'll post the original video if you like, if you want to compare the two versions. So these soldiers have been rehearsing for five days an assault sequenced in different phases. The approach, the inter-weapon coordination, close combat, and trench cleaning actually. The instructor says that it's a risk if the exercise is not respected and that's why they repeat it so intensively over and over again so that the soldiers in training integrate the right reflexes it's just army drill i think that's called training and practice so yeah also push stories of hundreds of french foreign volunteers fighting in ukraine like in January, when Russia launched a missile strike against a hotel in Kharkiv, claiming that 60 French foreign volunteers had been KIA. Obviously, we don't know about the exact number, but it's very possible that there were indeed foreign volunteers in that building. Or when Russian Telegram talks about the maintenance teams for the damaged Caesar self-propelled artillery to be French technicians. As of now, we can confirm 14 French volunteers KIA in Ukraine. But obviously, if special forces are involved, this could be higher. On the 2nd of February 2024, the BBC wrote, Two French volunteers KA in a Russian drone strike, Macron confirms. We don't know who they were or what they were doing there. What's interesting is that shortly after the Kiev Independent reported, foreign volunteers, NGO workers and embassy staff are banned from entering parts of Kherson Oblast without permission from the authorities. So all this is the current French involvement in Ukraine. No, not French involvement. It's a commitment by French citizens on Ukrainian souls, not by France. They are volunteers like, for example, the Spanish International Brigades during the Civil War. 
in Spain during 36 and 39. There were German volunteers in these brigades, but does that mean that the German state was involved? No, it's uh, a commitment by some individual citizens, not from the state, and it's very different. But what if the French army actually decided to intervene? This is what Zelensky said about this possibility on French national TV. Tant que l'Ukraine est là, tant que l'Ukraine tient, l'armée française peut rester sur le territoire français. Now, what if the front collapses? Like we said in the introduction, NATO has Mission Aigle deployed in Romania. The 1,000 strong task force is led by a French commander. They act as an observation force that could be strengthened and upgraded into a quick reaction brigade. Thing is, we're actually talking about a multinational battle group. Not all 1,000 are French soldiers. In March 2023, a recon platoon of 27 troops from Luxembourg joined them. So basically, the entire army. And in okay, that's a funny one. Nice one, legend. Nice one. July 2023, a mechanized company from Belgium came to reinforce them, composed of 300 soldiers and 24 Piranha armored fighting vehicles. On the 25th of July, four Caesar self-propelled howitzers were added to the contingent. Technically, if the French jump in, the Belgian contingent and these 27 guys from Luxembourg will have to go in as well. And on top of that, we can ask ourselves, how many soldiers can France realistically deploy? Theoretical strength, 1,000 military personnel. But we can definitely expect this battle group to be strengthened in the following months, if there is really an intent to push towards Odessa. Perhaps the Belgian and Luxembourgish contingents could be replaced by French troops, like units of the French Foreign Legion, for example. Realistically, we can expect the French mission to be composed of at least 1,500 to 2,000 men. This would be equivalent to two GTIA, Groupement Tactique Interarm, or in English. Okay, in the video he mentioned at the beginning of the video involving uh, French military experts. Actually, the guy was a lieutenant colonel. Uh, he was more talking about 20,000 soldiers, but hypothetically, once again. English Combined Arms Battle Group. From an operational perspective, this task force would depart from the Romanian border. It would have to push 230 kilometers to Odessa along the M34 road through Moldova, hoping all roads are intact and that no Spetsnaz or Transnistrian troops block the path of approach. There was also a faster coastal route, but Russian missile strikes damaged the existing bridge. Then the French task force would need to advance another 50 kilometers up to the Tilihul estuary. Why? Number one, this would provide a natural water barrier to enemy columns. Number two, it would protect the E95 highway linking Odessa with the rest of the country. However, this means, in theory, the French detachment of 1,000 to 2,000 troops would have to defend and cover a front of 60 kilometers on their own. Option two would be to station... But this is where we can also discuss the functions that the French army would take on then. And I can imagine more that they would be involved in some training, bringing in very specific know-how and so on. Nothing more with these little soldiers. In them somewhere around the Suvarovsky district in order to stop Russian columns from entering the city. The overall objective could be similar as to what the Russians did in Kosovo in 1999. Essentially on the night of June 11th, Russia sent a peacekeeping force of 30 armored vehicles carrying 250 troops straight to the Pristina International Airport before the NATO contingent could get there. This move by the Russian troops caught NATO by surprise and forced them to negotiate directly with Russia. Now the $1 million question is, is the Russian army ready to walk over the bodies of French soldiers to get to Odessa? <laughs> All these plans, option one, option two, they're beautiful. But with what troops? Here from Le Monde on the 30th of January 2024, France begins a drastic reduction in its military personnel and its bases in West Africa. So we can see France is repatriating military personnel to the mainland, perhaps for redeployment to the Eastern Theater. The big problem of the French military is their projection of force capabilities. At this moment, France is said to be able to deploy 15,000 soldiers over the span of multiple weeks, if not months. 
In theory, this expeditionary force could be equipped with 1,000 vehicles, including 140 Leclerc main battle tanks, 130 Jaguars wheeled armored fighting vehicles, 800 other IFVs, and 48 Caesar self-propelled artillery units. As you can expect, these numbers are extremely optimistic. Other analysts believe that only 10,000 men could actually be deployed. Meanwhile, in 2014, former Chief of Staff General Rakt Madou said that the ground forces could only realistically deploy as many as 7,000 French soldiers abroad. Rem and 10 years ago, that's when the politic class acknowledged that uh, France was paying the bill for 30 years of reduction of the military budget. And since then, military appropriation have been increased and there has been a lot of consensus about the political class that there was a need to reinvest in the army. But then again, we are talking about an expeditionary force like the British expeditionary force during World War I in France. And I think that we are not there at all. Remember that the peak strength of French deployment in the Sahel was 5,500 troops with a very limited number of armored vehicles and artillery. Now we're not even talking about the logistics of this entire operation. Just look at the distance between the French border and the Romanian-Ukrainian border. We're talking about 2,000 kilometers. There's no way France can do this on their own. NATO will have to back them up. Yeah, and this involves the trespassing of uh, many sovereign states by the French army. So, of course, NATO and European Union and all the other states would have to back them up just to allow them to pass by. So <laughs> it's still a long way to go. We have to remember that in 2011, during the French intervention against Gaddafi in Libya, NATO had to take over an operation that French forces were simply unable to carry out alone. Two years later, during the 2013 military intervention in Mali, France asked its allies to strengthen their logistical aid, mainly with transport aircraft. In 2022, Le Point wrote, French withdrawal from Mali, logistical headache ahead. The logistical maneuver consisted of evacuating 2,500 military personnel, and this proved to be extremely complex. Put simply, without US and European logistic support, Operation Croissant on the Dnieper would be impossible. Now to make the situation even more complicated, on March 10th, French President Emmanuel Macron announced the opening of a permanent military mission in Chisinau in the coming months. The two countries signed a defense agreement on March 7th. Courrier International reported, once again creating surprise, France gives guarantees to Moldova against Russia. So France, a country that can't even deploy 10,000 soldiers abroad, is now handing over defense agreements to everyone, like Willy Wonka and his golden tickets. But it's diplomatic games, spheres of influence, and so on. Diplomatic is just a giant pissing contest, you know? There we are talking about a treaty of mutual assistance. It does not necessarily mean a defensive pact or a guarantee of independence. It's just expanding your influence its diplomacy. Let's not forget that in September 2023, the Moldovan army purchased a Grandmaster 200 air defense radar for 14.5 million euros from France. This means there could be an alternative plan with the deployment of French troops in Moldova. And if you ask me, this is where things get really interesting. If there's one French detachment positioned in Romania, and let's say another one equally strong deployed in Moldova, well, their official mission could be to rush towards Odessa if the Russians approach. But this could also be a decoy, when in fact they would concentrate against Transnistria. And that's how they could storm Tiraspol, take over the entire territory and give it back to Moldova. One objective could be to secure the Kobasna ammunition depot containing 20,000 tons of Soviet-era weapons. This could be done in cooperation with Moldovan army units that have been intensifying military exercises on the border with Transnistria. The big question is the following. What if fighting erupts between French and Russian forces? This escalation could lead the world straight to a nuclear war. 
We have to remember that the doctrine of former French President de Gaulle regarding nuclear weapons was to use them only to preserve the territorial integrity of the homeland. And I don't think that fighting in Ukraine falls into this category. Me Neither do I. French nuclear weapons are used for deterrence, not aggression. If Russia has not used it so far, there's a reason for that. Deterrence of the other nuclear powers and France would also put itself offside if they use the nuclear power. Meanwhile, some analysts believe that Macron's warmonger attitude is only for short-term opportunistic political goals. Mm -hmm. You see, there will be European parliamentary elections in June 2024. Mm -hmm. Things are not looking good for Macron's party. According to the latest polls, it's the far-right opposition party RN that will come out victorious with a 12% lead over Macron's party. That's huge! So Yes, Macron is a convinced European, while the far-right party is anti-European and has twice reached the second round of elections by an even smaller margin over the past decade. So Macron believes that the only way for France to exist internationally is by taking the lead at European level. So I rather believe in this maneuver. The far-right party, on the other hand, has been rather pro-Putin and the war in Ukraine has blown up in their faces. So by reassessing its support towards Ukraine, it's a political stunt in order to discredit the other side. So what could a hawkish politician do? During a parliamentary debate, Prime Minister Gabriel Attal fell short of accusing the far-right opposition of treason. He said being pro-Putin is simply being pro-Putin, just like you. Support for Ukraine, the parties which vote against, will play into Putin's hands, thinks General Vincent Desportes. Even the conservatives railed for the small electoral tactics of the head of state but showed support for Kiev nonetheless. Actually, this is what the party chief of the conservatives said. I reiterated the Republicans' total support for Ukraine. But on the other hand, I repeated our complete opposition to the commitment of ground troops. So by claiming to send troops in Ukraine, Macron and the French establishment can vilify opposition parties and label them as traitors, cowards, agents of the Kremlin, or all three. So let's see if this grandiose military intervention is still on the table after the summer. Now, as for the history lesson, at the end of World War I, the French government was getting concerned by the rise of the Bolsheviks in the Russian Empire. In December 1918, it was decided to launch an expedition towards Ukraine to support the Russian White Armies. In 1981, J. Kim Mulholland summarized the expedition for most Western historians. The French military intervention appeared to have been badly organized, insufficiently supplied, and ill-defined in its objectives. Politically, the operation made sense. However, before it started, many French generals believe it was not possible militarily speaking. They preferred to arm local anti-Bolshevik forces and limit French involvement to advisors. Even Berthelot, the general in charge of the expedition quickly realized it was doomed when he was tasked to secure all of Ukraine with only three divisions instead of the 12 promised. And one of the three divisions was suffering from influenza epidemics. And yes, France, which had already lost a generation into the trenches, was about to lose a second one with the Spanish flu wasn't necessarily too keen on the idea of sending troops into battle. And by the way, they were not the only ones the British got involved, as did the Americans, the Japanese, and even you had the Czech Legion. And by the way, there's a video game about their adventure called The Last Train Home that came out recently. And if you've tried it, please let me know in the comments if it's worth your time. Thanks. So in exchange, they received some Greek reinforcements, however, who were not very keen to be under French command. Morale of the French troops was low. They were promised demobilization after years of war, and they just wanted to return home. And the cold weather of Eastern Europe was not suitable for colonial troops. Overall, most of the French soldiers didn't even know why they were fighting. On top of that, there were several 
pro-Bolshevik mutinies. The expedition in Ukraine came under false assumptions. In reality, the White Army of the Volunteers was far from united and showed little will to fight. The local population resented Allied intervention as they preferred the Bolsheviks to the White Army. Unable to stop the advancing Bolshevik troops, the French contingent abandoned Odessa in March 1919. The French military intervention in Ukraine was a sobering lesson in the perils of intervening in another nation's civil war. That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my work, make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal. The link are in the description below. My friends. Okay, I think we've come to more or less the same conclusion. It's more or less a publicity stunt, certainly a provocation, a pissing contest with Putin if you want, but Above all, it's a political maneuver. Once again, everything is hypothetical and the future could prove us wrong. So let's wait and see the development. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching and have a nice day. Bye.